Okay, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Greater Glider Survey Design and Monitoring Workshop. Thank you so much for joining us. It looks like we have lots of people here with us, which is excellent. My name is Jen Martin, and I'm going to be facilitating this session. And I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement of country. BioLinks Alliance is proud to acknowledge the traditional owners of the places where we live and work. And we recognize and respect the enduring relationships they've had with their lands and water. And we pay our respects to elders past, present and future. So we've got a really fantastic session happening now for the next 45 minutes. And I'm really delighted to be joined by some amazing experts who you're gonna hear more from in a moment. But I'll just start by letting you know how the session is going to run. Essentially, I've got some questions that I'd like to ask Cara and Louise and Rena and Bert. And then about halfway through the session, I'm going to be opening the floor for questions from you guys. So if you think of a question you'd like to ask as we're going through, please feel free to put it into the chat box so that we can come to it later. Uh, if you uh, have, if you'd like your question to be directed to a particular person on our panel, one of our experts, then please feel free to put their name alongside the question so we know that. You will also have the chance to unmute yourself later and ask your question directly if you would prefer that. The other thing to let you know is that we really want your input. And so we've put together a short survey with some questions around Greater Glider survey design and monitoring. And you'll find the link to that survey in the chat. So please, anytime you feel like jumping in and completing that either during the session or at the end of the session, we'd be really grateful for that. So what are we here to talk about today? Well, I guess greater gliders have been uh, traditionally recognised as being or thought of as being easy to detect. But uh, the recent development of improved survey protocols have shown us that that's just not always the case. And so I think understanding population trends really relies on certainly long term monitoring, but also confident assumptions around detectability and really robust survey design. So those are some of the things that we're going to be talking about with our experts this morning. So Cara, welcome. I'd like to start with you. Before I give you a question, could you briefly introduce yourself, please? Hi, I'm Kerry Gungan Tobb, and I'm a research fellow at the Australian National University. And my background is in nutritional ecology and landscape ecology. And I have spent um, almost two decades now working with greater gliders and koalas and other eucalypt folivores, trying to understand um, why they live where they live and, and also what threats they're facing and how to mitigate some of those with management. Terrific. Thank you, Cara. So what I'd like to ask you about is how adequate do you think existing survey techniques and protocols are for greater gliders? Well, I, in that space, David Lindenmeyer did a lot of really great work um, looking at the how effective things like spotlighting surveys are by working in, in habitat fragments in which they could find and color every animal inside and then do spotlighting surveys to see how many that they found. And so he did that work with Matthew Pope, and I think they discovered that they saw about 20% of the animals through spotlighting surveys. So there's a lot of animals that they weren't seeing. Anytime you have a nocturnal animal that is living high in the canopy, it's going to you know, be cryptic and difficult to find every animal there. I think the most important thing is that the survey method that you use is consistent between sites that you use the same type of methodology. Um, I do think spotlighting, even for its limitations, is probably one of the best ways that we have um, to detect greater gliders and get a assessment of their abundance. Stag watching is another method that people use and you need a lot of people for that, um, but you can get some indication of site occupancy, of course, um, as well as have some idea of what hollows that they're using. And I think um, a statistician that's working with David now is looking into how that compares or doesn't to spotlighting survey efforts. Um, so, you know, there's a few different methods out there. They all are limited, but whatever you use, it, it should be, you know, comparable apples for apples, um, the same across sites. Fantastic. Would anyone else like to jump in with any comments on uh, our existing protocols and techniques? 
Um, I just wanted to say, just backing up Cara there with the um, using the spotlighting, a good thing with Greater Glider, because spotlighting has been like the methods of how you go into the bush and do it and how much repetition is going to change from project to project. But um, I think the fact that you're using spotlighting from the 1980s or earlier to now makes it really good for comparing and for us to be able to see those declines if we were using different methods, like there's so much good technology for detection now, like if you look at other animals that we've changed to using remote cameras, and that was you, you, that usually overtook things like trapping, which the remote cameras generally are so much better, you can't really do the comparisons that we've been able to do for Greater Glider. So it just shows you that importance of using the same method over time it means you can actually compare numbers, even if you have to change a few things for the actual other methods around it. Well, can Thank I, you, Rena. Can I also jump in? So that um, Cara's comment about the 80% of um, animals weren't detected or were detected poorly in, in, Dave, in some of David's work. Um, I know Louise has been involved in some research in Victoria where they similarly found that detection rates were a lot less than we'd all assumed for so many decades that you know we were seeing most of the greater gliders out there simply because they didn't move very much and they had very strong eye shine so i'm looking forward to hearing what louise um what that work that ari did uh found in terms of detection rates because that's such a critical um, aspect of uh, determining population trends or getting a handle on how many animals are living in the landscape. That's the perfect segue, Bert, thank you, because I will turn to you now, Louise. If I could just <clears throat> ask you to briefly introduce yourself and then uh, we can certainly get a comment on, on what Bert's just spoken about then before we go into another question. Sure, thanks, Jenny. Um, my name's Louise Durkin. I'm an ecologist with the Arthur Ryler Institute. Um, so we're a biodiversity research institute with the Department of Environment, Land, Water and Planning in Victoria. So I'm a government scientist. We sit within a government department, um, but we're an applied ecology research institute. So our role is to conduct research to advise government. Um, yeah, so you're right, Cara and Bert, in that, you know, we've all heard this morning that Greater gliders were once one of the most um, commonly recorded species in uh, nocturnal arboreal mammal surveys. And because they have such bright eye shine and because they tend to sit still and stare back at you, um, you feel like when you go out there, you, you've got a, quite a good detection probability when you, when you lock eyes on a greater glider compared to some of the other arboreal species, which are much more light shy, seemingly. They might run around the back of a trunk or um, be really fast or run away from you. It seems like greater gliders um, are quite detectable. But from that um, study that Cara referred to, um, where David Lynn and I went out and tested the spotlighting method, um, where about 20, I think, animals were collared, so they had known locations for the animals, and they found, you know, about 20 to 26 percent detection probability, which is actually really, really quite low. Um, Similarly, a Brendan Wintel study from East Gippsland found that with a single visit, single observer, the detection probability for uh, greater gliders is only about 40%. And our work in the Strathbogies a couple of years ago, um, we had something around about 60% with a single observer, single visit. So after the listing of the greater glider, we, um, we wanted to sort of try and address that apparently low detection probability. So um, we started looking at um, other ways to assess abundance. So one of the ways you can um, quite validly and robustly assess abundance of animals in the wild is um, a method called distance sampling, where you have a line transect through the bush um, and you go and you survey the animals. Um, and that means that if you account for the distance from the transect line that you saw the animals, um, you can fit it into an analysis and come up with an estimate of how many animals per unit area, like per hectare. Um, however, that 
method works quite well if you're working on, say, kangaroos in a grassland, but if you're working on uh, greater gliders in a forest, uh, you're unable to be sure that you're seeing everything on the transect line with 100% certainty. And so we've trialled a method in the Strathbogies, um, which has since been adopted more broadly, um, which we're calling it's double observer distance sampling or mark recapture distance sampling, um, which we think is an improvement um, where you have two observers and they simultaneously yet independently survey a transect. So you'll have both people going along um, separated by about 10 to 15 minutes and they'll both survey um, the transect. And then at the end of the survey, you compare notes, figure out who's seen um, which gliders. So which gliders have been seen by observer one, which have been seen by observer two and which have been seen by both. Um, and we found from that work that again, only about 20% of gliders were seen by both individuals. So by both observers. So if you'd only had one person and one visit, it is quite low, but um, we've got a paper in review actually um, demonstrating that the method really improves our ability to estimate abundance. It's quite a long so Louise, answer, that, sorry. No, no, that's great, Louise. So you're talking about estimating abundance with that new technique. Um, how is How does that um, relate to current best practice for, for greater glider surveys for, for um, identifying their presence. Are we talking about the same mm. technique or are there other techniques? There are other techniques and uh, of course it depends It depends what the objective of the survey is, so what the question is. So if, if your objective, you know, for example, stag watching can be a really good technique for long-term monitoring because if you always go back to the same sites, you always use exactly the same um, method, then it it's really informative to help you learn about what trends over time are at a particular place or set of places. Um, whereas if, if your question is, well, at this current point in time, how many greater gliders might there be in this catchment area or this part of Victoria? Um, um, to do something like distance sampling or microcapture distance sampling and or repeat visits is, um, would improve your, your, um, your estimate. So, for example, for some of the COOP surveys where they do pre-harvest surveys, it's obviously really important that we try and get as close as we can to the truth of, of how many greater gliders might be there. Um, and for that reason, we, we've advised now to do both double observer distance sampling as well as repeat visits to try and get the best answer we can. Okay, fantastic, Louise. Rena, I'd like to bring you in now um, to continue talking about uh, survey design approaches, but could you begin by introducing yourself, please? Um, I'm Rena. I've done a lot of work for Goongar Environment Centre um, as a volunteer, and I also work as a consultant, so I've done a, worked on a few Greater Glider projects as well through the years. Okay. Fantastic, thank you. So I guess following on directly from what Louise was talking about, what I wanted to ask you was whether one survey design fits all situations. And I'm pretty sure you're gonna say no. So maybe you could talk to us about different designs for different different places and, um, and yeah, situations. Yeah, well, that's a big question actually, because um, <laughs> it does depend on how, what, what you're asking. So as Louise has already addressed that, um, how you're going to design a project does depend on what you want to know. So it depends if you want to compare it over time. It depends if you're looking at, so just say a lot of the citizen science projects in logging areas are looking at an area that's about to get logged. So it's going to change, but they want to, people will want to find out how many gliders are in there at a particular time because unfortunately that's how the legislation works. You have to find a number. Um, so like the current method of spotlighting in a transect, you would, you would do that, but you may want to survey as much as the coop as you can because you've got to find a certain number per hectare. So you may do your transect and you may repeat it but you also may just look at every single tree in the whole coop. So you may have multiple transects. And what you have to look for then is when you're, the reason why you walk a transect is because you're looking out 
And you also record, so you record the distance that you see the animal at and you record a compass bearing and you walk along one transect so that you don't repeat um, seeing the same animal again. So you, you have to do all that. And then at the end, if you've got animals that could be the same animals. So you map it all out and, and that's how you would do that. And you would do it as many times as you can, but you've to see your highest number over different nights, but your time of course is limited. And I suppose that's the same with government coop surveys. If you're working as the ecologist, you would do the method that Louise has just said. So repetition to observers, but you have a certain select amount of time. So the best thing for surveying properly is to survey different seasons um, as many times as you can and over a number of years because we don't just have four seasons. We have La Nina and El Nino and that changes um, populations. And as we know, climate change is changing populations as well. So to get all that variant out, you really have to do long-term surveying over a number of years and a number of different types of years, depending on what seasonality is happening in the Pacific Ocean at the time. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, but it does depend on the question. So if people have a question yeah. of how they want to know how to survey something, then maybe that might be uh, easier to address. Rena, a, a lot of it's driven by the context too, isn't it? So the, the imperative for lots of community groups is um, defined by the perceived lack of action from government. So, so therefore community groups are sort of forced to adopt the methodology that, you know, government would accept for, um, you know, accepting data about greater glider detection rates or those sorts of things. But, but the whole other side um, then potentially is ignored. You know, you could do surveys, um, you know, not using standard techniques. Um, and I'm, maybe I'm jumping the gun a bit because I might talk about this a bit later because it's, um, it's also a, a case that you've got to create a narrative, don't you, to bring the community along with you. I mean, nothing happens in isolation. So selecting your survey technique is often more than, it's a broader question than just what is the best scientific methodology, but what methodology can we use? Do we have the capacity to use? And that will allow us to tell a story um, that then gets traction either with the public or, or with policymakers or, or whoever. But how yeah, about we that's... jump in now and, and introduce you because then we can continue the conversation. I'm just conscious that you haven't had your chance to be introduced yet. So, um, Bert, please tell us who you are and then uh, let's continue the conversation. Okay, so I'm Bertram Lobert and I am, I'm beaming in from the beautiful Strathbogie Ranges behind me. It doesn't all look like that. It's actually a largely cleared landscape. Um, that, that, that vision behind me is the Strath, part of the Strathbogie Forest. And, and I'm here mainly, um, I mean, in, sort of, I'm an ecologist, I suppose, broadly, but I'm here mainly because of my work um, and advocacy with the Strathbogie Rangers Conservation Management Network that has, for the last sort of 10 years or so, um, entered this space of uh, forest management on public land and obviously greater gliders is it's, it's a large part of that story and I've lived in this landscape for about 30 years so you know it's home and I care about um, its management and what's happening to it. Thank you Bert so you were just talking about the narrative um, that goes with our um, survey design and our desire to know more and also around capacity. So can you talk to me about citizen science and how can we meaningfully get citizen scientists involved in this work? Yeah, so like all your questions, that's a big one. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, Look, so we've got to we've got to survey um, whether it's via transects or you know site specific locations, um, the sort of thing that uh, David Lindenmeyer was doing and basing a lot of his population decline stuff on for greater gliders over the last few decades. It, it, 
you know, you can cut it different ways, but we've got to go out there and survey. And obviously you choose a method that's going to give you confidence in results that hopefully the, the information you collect is useful beyond your own immediate needs. Um, but citizen science is filling a gap now, isn't it? I mean, uh, I'm old enough, m maybe some of the listeners or viewers, you know, if you, if, you, if, you, if you haven't yet reached 30 years of age, you probably wouldn't even realize that at one point in time, like last century, the, the government actually routinely did lots of, um, in different projects and different guises, but did a lot of, um, lot of flora and fauna survey, uh, mainly vertebrates, uh, but it was kind of a routine part of the work. It just happens very rarely now. So citizen science is actually critical for generating sort of baseline, um, you know, data for so many species. Um, and, but rather than talk about the, the, the sort of the, the methodology from a citizen science point of view, it, it's, it's critical to, you know, under, to, to get to know <laughs> your, the, the thing that you're investigating, because if you don't, as the old adage goes, if you don't, um, if you don't know something, you can't love it. And if you don't love it, you can't protect it. And, and citizen science is all about advocating for in, improved you know, in, in improved protections and improved management of, of the natural world. But in, in the Strathbogies, in, in our citizen science project, we really had sort of multiple objectives, um, you know, looking at it in hindsight. And yes, one of them was about um, collecting data so that we could sort of get on the map and maybe get some traction, whether that was political or, or whatever. Um, but telling stories and creating a narrative is, is just critical. And, and everybody in this forum would probably understand that even if they haven't interrogated that um, idea terribly. Um, you know, it's, it's really not an, it, it helps a lot if you've got a cute and cuddly, but it helps even more if you can tell a compelling, you know, story about it. And, and the, other, the other thing that citizen science can really do is create opportunities for professionals, you know, whether it's researchers or whether it's the government department to, to enter the space. You know, there's so much antagonism uh, in this space, so much conflict that often we just stick to our own little, <laughs> you know, our own little patches. Um, and, and we, through circumstance, um, were lucky enough to um, through our own citizen science um, project where we demonstrated at least anecdotally, you know, through our own surveys that there were still lots of greater gliders in the Strathbogie forest and, and at fairly high detection rates. And because of our connections and because maybe um, the, the conversations that we were having, you know, then the government uh, environment department did get involved in doing some surveys up here. And, you know, it, it became a very useful um, well, and in the long term, a very constructive um, approach to take. So, so I think citizen science can play so many roles and it, it just really depends on people getting together, working out what they've got, you know, devising a plan that suits you and so that I don't ramble on for too long, um, you know, Coming up with the coming up with the achievable outcomes that tick multiple boxes because you really don't know where you're going to land. That's part of the excitement of citizen science is you, you're constantly discovering. No different to any other research really, but it, at a community level, you know, there's a great deal of empowerment that can come from that. Fantastic, Bert. Thank you. So in just a moment, I am going to uh, throw it open to the floor. I can see we do already have some questions, which is terrific. If you do have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Uh, if you prefer to speak up and be able to ask your question yourself, uh, I'll try and remember to keep scrolling through my screens and you can just use the reactions down in the bottom right to put your hand up and let me know that you'd like to speak. Um, but just before I go to one of the questions in the chat, um, I know Louise 
Louise, you were just about to speak uh, earlier and I'm not sure what I interrupted when I wanted to, uh, to introduce Bert. Did you want to add anything? I guess the, the, the remaining question on my list was just whether any of you wanted to comment any further about um, what particular protocols really lend themselves to long-term monitoring. And obviously, Bert, you've just spoken to that a little bit with the, um, the capacity that citizen science brings, but would anyone else like to speak to the idea of long-term monitoring? Silence. <laughs> I can make a couple of small points. Um, they may be obvious, but I suppose they're worth mentioning anyway. But um, long-term monitoring is um, obviously important if, as long as you are, um, you've chosen an appropriate or representative set of monitoring sites to visit again and again and again, so that we can um, recognise trends over time. Um, and those sites should be ideally representative of the broader landscape so that you know you're not we're not having developing a biased idea of what's going on because you've chosen your favorite spot or a spot that doesn't get disturbed as much as the broader landscape you know those sorts of considerations so having a bit of a you know really thinking it through before you as you develop a monitoring program um uh what else was it? I think that was the main point about, oh, that's right, about, um, I was going to give a shout out for the, um, just the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas, um, just on the, um, how can citizen science um, make contributions, um, um, just in a, a seemingly small way, but it is quite important. Um, the records that are contributed from um, the Victorian public or professionals, including citizen science, of wildlife, flora and fauna to the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas are actually really important and form um, the government's repository of what exists where, when, and um, it is used a lot in planning and management of the land, things like plan burning, um, harvesting, um, they will all go to the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas and check what has been recorded there. So if you know of something important somewhere, um, that is one way that um, it can be recognised. Um, and it is also possible to mask records if, if there are sensitive sites, so. Can I add something to that? Yes, please. <laughs> um, so uh, I've just been looking in my own backyard, been busy here really in the Strathbogies for quite a few years. But when I look at Northeast Victoria generally, like it's a huge region and there's very little information on lots of species and particularly greater gliders. Like there are some um, areas of state forest, you know, that might be a thousand square kilometers in size. And there's 10 records um, of, of greater gliders, you know, in, in the last 40 years, for example. And, and I just wonder if um, a methodology like, you know, a point location um, sampling technique, and I don't know what um, was used by ANU in the past, and, and if those sites were somehow, you know, like I'm just thinking of a, a bigger project, a little bit like a, you know, a BBA or iNaturalist type project where the sites are known, where anybody who's going past that site can stop, be there for 15 minutes, um, you know, using, using a spotlight or, or whatever technique is available to sort of slowly generate that long-term data at multiple points, which, which is easy if it's set up, but if it's not set up, it'll never be collected. Just, just, a, just a thought. It's mm. not a bad idea, but um, I've seen something similar from certain local councils where they have set photo points along creeks and they invite mm. the public to take a picture and submit it. And it's a bit of a way to in involve, you know, the public in monitoring um, in a small way. Um, I suppose you'd have, if you're asking people to identify things, you're potentially inviting a bit of, you know, observer error, depending on observer expertise of was it a sugar glider or not, and that sort of thing. Um, but as you say, there is there are large areas with so few records, um, and there are obviously things there, but we just don't have information on what was there. So it's surprising, really, when you look at it. There's a lot of records of magpies around Melbourne, but other huge state forest areas, there's very few records. In my experience, it can be somewhat hard to access a lot of these areas 
um, they are rather remote by, you know, civilized standards. So I think that's part of why people aren't there and it's hard to get citizen science involved, like, you know, in the Central Highlands in Victoria, as well as out in Tumit, um, and even along the South Coast. I mean, these forests, you get into them through fire trails <laughs> and then, you know, just walking through there at night, it, it's not very easy ground to get across. And so I think that keeps people out and in a way that they could do helpful surveys in large part. But that's not to say there aren't places where there are roads that people could go along and help. So I think maybe if if we did some thinking about where that would be possible for people to access safely and get into, um, then that could be a, a useful method to involve people. Um, but I think there's just huge areas of Australia that are very hard to get into unless you're a really keen backwoods backpacker um, and know how to you know, be in remote places. I see a lot of people also commenting on the use of drones or thermal cameras for greater gliders. And there has been some work done around that now. And you really need a big temperature gradient. So it can be difficult to use those thermal cameras like in the summer um, when the ambient temperature and the greater glider aren't that different when you take into the thermal properties of the greater glider fur, which is really insulating. But certainly in cooler forests or in areas where it's winter time and there's gonna be a big difference between the ambient temperature and the animal's temperature, I've seen amazing images from um, unmanned aerial vehicles with thermal cameras on them where you can see the animals eating leaves, <laughs> like they're such high resolution. You can definitely tell the difference between brush tails and greater gliders. So I think there's multiple factors that play into whether that can work as well as the fact that different states have different rules in different areas have different requirements for where you can fly and when you can fly and if you have to be licensed and all that. Um, but I think there is a lot of potential for it. And I hope to see that space grow more because I think that's probably one of the most promising areas for doing wide scale surveys. Thank you, Tara, for picking up what's going on in the chat, because there's lots of interesting discussion happening. If you're not following that, there's been some um, excellent comments and, and sharing links. But we've got about 15, a little bit less than 15 minutes. So I do want to jump into some of the questions that have been posed to you guys in the chat. So going right back uh, to an earlier question from Matt Chick, the question is, uh, do detection rates change with the number of times you visit a site? And is there a sweet spot? Is there a perfect number of times to visit a particular site? And do we know that? Anybody who would like to have a go at that one? Uh, I can maybe um, draw on some information from Brendan Wintel's um, PhD, I think. He published a really useful uh, paper on um, looking at detection probabilities for um, certain forest dependent species like arboreal mammals and owls um, and from his work um, I think I mentioned before that a single visit single observer detection probability for great gliders was um, about 40 percent with two visits that increased to about 65 percent and with three visits up to about 80 percent and then it sort of reached an asymptote and leveled off um, at around, you know, six or seven or eight or nine, any more than six, you, you're not really um, in, improving your chances of detecting more than you would have. Um, there's always a balance, of course, with how much time and funding you can um, afford to spend revisiting the same site rather than visiting more sites, less times. Um, uh, the Victorian government survey standards for um, greater gliders is, um, recommends three visits, I think. Um, and as well as the current forest protection survey program uh, surveys, the previous surveys are also doing um, three visit number of. Sorry, Louise, we just lost, lost part of what you were saying at the end there. Look, Sorry, I, no, I should let others speak. Uh, go ahead, Bert. Uh, <clears throat> look, look, mine isn't a great insight other than it's highly variable. And there's so many variables, you know, whether it's, whether it's time of year, whether it's, um, you know, the, the amount of wind in the canopy, all, all of those, it's, it's just so variable. Um, I would just really quickly just like to address a couple of things on thermal imaging, which Cara also spoke right. about. Um, and not that it's, look, I've only been using it for a couple of years. Um, 
and I wouldn't say I, I actually use it now, you know, in order to detect because, I mean, greater gliders are relatively detectable, but, you know, they're, I don't know if you can see that, probably not. I'm, I'm using a sort of a small handheld thermal imager, a, a, a monocular. They're, they're still a little bit expensive, expensive, I mean, but you can get a really good one for a couple of thousand bucks and for for bigger projects, they, they, they are just fantastic. Not because, you know, it gives you that much greater ability to detect greater gliders, for example, but it just opens a door into perceiving uh, the, the nighttime forest that you just would not, you know, you, with, if you haven't done it before, it's hard to imagine. And there are other people on the chat that, you know, have way more experience in this. Um, and it's, it's certainly difficult integrating that technology into um, survey methods, but just in terms of, again, um, collecting information and um, creating a narrative, um, coming up with videos and images, um, and just the amount of stuff you see. I had no idea, literally, how many feather tail gliders um, are populating our forests. Um, before I started looking at it thermally. I mean, they are just, in the Strathbogies at least, they are everywhere. And numerically, probably the most, one of the most abundant um, arboreal mammals. Now they're not threatened, but just that insight, um, and there are other little, you know, Eastern Pygmy possums or whatever, Fasca gales, they're all sort of of that size that um, it just allows you to ask more questions and get more people involved. Um, just wanted to throw that in. But having spent many years uh, spotlighting in the Strathbogies, now I'm sad that I saw so few feather tail gliders. Mm -hmm. They were clearly in front of me all the time. <laughs> all the time, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, another life, hey? Um, mm. I want to go back to a question that Paul posed much earlier, and Paul was referring to um, the Vic Forest's 2018 regulatory handbook, which uh, apparently specifies that greater glider protection protocols outside East Gippsland don't actually depend on greater glider survey counts, but rather depend on the presence of hollow trees um, of 1.5 dBH, certain size per hectare, and then we need at least one hollow per tree of 15 centimetres or greater, you know, all of that stuff. The question is, is that protocol actually still valid for um, the practice of Vic Forests? <laughs> I saw that question earlier. Um, uh, I know that Big Forest released that a year or two ago before the Victorian government had released the action statement for credit gliders, which announced new prescriptions Victoria wide. And I think that was, um, I think that was a, a bit of a Big Forest decided to take an initiative and de declare what their own um, prescriptions would be. Um, I must say I'm unsure if they're still practicing that um, Victoria wide or if the action statement has superseded it. Do you have any information on that, Rena? Um, I'm not with that area. So I do know that the action statement doesn't mean anything until it gets put into the planning standards, but it's usually abided by. So um, even if it's not like, even if it's not legal yet because it hasn't caught up with what's in the planning standards, it's often used. Um, so I'm not sure with the, like that forest management area, but that's usually what happens generally is that it would probably go to the action statement but that might not be legally bounding because it's not in the planning standards. Yeah, so the action statement for greater gliders, as with the action statement for something like a large brown tree frog, are not yet in the legally binding document, the planning standards, as you say, but um, in the interim, Vic Forest have been, um, if those numbers are found on a coop, they have been um, amending their practices. Um, and the current um, prescription for greater gliders is five or more in a kilometre, in a spot like kilometre. Okay, we've got a few minutes left. I'm just looking, there's been a good discussion in the chat around drones, but a question we haven't directly um, 
tackled yet is from Phil Marshall. And Phil asks whether you have any tips on how you might design pre and post logging surveys to determine the impact of certain logging techniques on glider numbers. Who wants to take that one? Um, I can talk a little bit about that. I think, you know, if you use kind of the best practice um, in terms of on the ground spotlighting methods where you have a couple of observers and you take repeated measurements, um, both before and after, and you combine that with vegetation surveys where you're looking at hollows and how many hollows might have been lost as well, um, then I think that that can give you a fairly good assessment of what's happened to both populations and some of the limiting resources that they have, like those tree hollows before and after logging. I might add to that that um, if you're doing before and after um, studies, it's, you, you must try and remember to have a control site, site or sites. Um, some studies have been designed looking at before and after impact, impacts of logging without controls, which really weakens your ability to say to what extent it was the direct impact of the, um, the logging or the impact itself. Yeah, I think that's another really good point that Louise raised. And I would just say from my own experience doing surveys in areas that are being logged, those control sites, it's fairly important that you both look at forest type and try to match them for forest type, but also that they don't occur right next to the areas that are being logged. Because even the like noise and everything that happens from disturbance can be enough the, I guess the gliders might go off about, I don't know what happens to them, but they do disappear from coops directly next to logging areas as well. Um, so um, put your controls at a little bit of a distance as long as you can still match the type of forest and other aspects to your other sites. I think it's also really difficult the before and after with um, logging. Like obviously a clear fell is very clear, um, but when you start to get like little like they've ret like retained some areas you kind of have a different method then of spotlighting because when you're in a forest full of lots of trees it's really hard to see so your vi your vision is impaired of how much you can see and so when there's a big area cut and you can now see a lot of other trees that's going to change your detection rate so there's all the logging happening around it, but there's also that your vision is, is different on each of those scenarios on how they're being logged. So it's really hard to compare, I feel. Um, I think your numbers have to be really different to be able to show a difference. And um, the other thing with it is there is also other things that come in. I went into a logging coop that had a little patch. It had just been logged. And there was five greater gliders in this small patch and there was one greater glider stuck out on a habitat tree in the middle of nowhere, just sort of looking a bit frazzled. And there was a powerful owl in the patch. So I don't know how much like predators have caught on to logging and disturbance and gone and looked at the opportunity that they've got once you start removing bits of forest. So it also depends on when you go in comparison to what's going on in the rest of the landscape. Um, so you have to kind of consider those things as well, but the visuals can actually work in being able to see more. So you might not be having a true comparison of what you saw before. Yeah, we used um, established transects. So we were walking the same line, but you, if it's just a thinning and, you know, not a clear cutting, then that does get rid of vegetation and you can see farther, but we would have a limit of 50 meters on either side of the line that we could spotlight. That doesn't mean that the vegetation was just as dense. So there probably is a detection variation to some degree. But I think if you're not doing an entire forest survey, but doing a transect line and you have a set distance on either side that you're following, um, that might help resolve some of those large differences. And something else that you were talking about, Rena, in terms of after effects. What about We've got about 20 seconds, Cara. 
Sorry, I'll try to make it really fast, but there's also changes in vegetation that can happen at edge effects that favor some competitors like brush-tailed possums. So what you see immediately after logging may not reflect what happens to those pop populations, you know, many months down the line. So I think it's important to revisit those sites in the future, not just immediately after logging as well. Having just told you to hurry up, Cara, I've just I've just been given a message from Sasha that I'm allowed to go a couple of minutes over if we need to. So would anyone else like to add anything just to finish finish that off before we we uh, thank everybody for joining us? Look, I, 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 yeah, I, I think that if we're so, so that investigative work of the impact of logging that can be done and that can be done through research. Um, and if it's done well, it can be then extra extrapolated or applied. But for most community, gr community groups, for example, I would question whether you want to bite off something like that because it's too, you know, you know there's, there's, it's very complex. And, and from a community group's point of view, um, you know, once the logging has occurred in, in part, um, well, you, you, like it's not, you haven't failed, but, um, you know, the horse has bolted, <laughs> if, if you like. So it, it's, it's a case of, of, yes, maybe that needs research. Maybe it's been done. I'm not across all that literature, but I'm like from, from our point of view or the CMN's point of view, that's not a, the highest priority in terms of where we put our efforts. Not that it isn't valuable or worthwhile, but just in, in context, I suppose, yeah. Fantastic, Bert, thank you. I was just gonna quickly follow up from Bert as well, what you're saying, has it been done? David Lindenmeyer, as you probably know, has done tons of work in this sphere in many different types of mm. log areas um, all throughout Victoria, as well as several places in New South Wales. So there is a huge body of research on what happens to greater gliders after logging and different kinds of logging. Mm. Yeah. Thank you, Cara. So thank you to all of you. I'm, I'm very grateful for such an interesting conversation. It was uh, really good to hear your opinions, Cara and Louise and Rena and Bert, obviously not just your opinions, also your knowledge. But of course, we are also interested in your input as audience members, and you'll see the link in the chat uh, to the short survey that we've put together around this question of Greater Glider survey uh, design and monitoring. So please grab the link, fill it in for us. We will also email it to you if you don't get the chance to do it today but I'd just like to thank all of you so much for joining us today and can we please give a nice quiet uh, round of applause to our panelists for your fantastic contributions and uh, have a lovely day everybody and particularly enjoy all the great sessions still to come thank you